Welcome to the Department of Medicine Grand Rounds. Before I start with uh, our presentation today, I want to remind everybody that the Joint Commission is coming soon to evaluate the University of Louisville Hospital and that there are a number of things that they're going to be looking at that I know for sure that you guys are paying attention to, but I want to make sure that uh, you are very much aware that some of the things you're looking at is transitions of care, documentation of the electronic record, the fact that if you're following a patient, there should be an attending note every day on the record, that if a patient is transferred from one unit to another, there should be a transition note. Uh, it doesn't have to be large, it, but some documentation that the other person on the other side can have information about what's going on with this patient. So the notes have to be there, documentation is important, transitions of care, notes every day on patients that you're following, signed by the attendings, all of those are crucial. Crucial. Okay, so today <clears throat> we have Dr. McLean who's gonna be speaking, but a couple of comments before that. Today was the birth uh, in 1843 of Robert Cook, Heinrich Hermann Robert Cook, a German physician, you all know him, the founder of science of bacteriology who discovered the tuberculosis bacillus in 1882 and then the uh, cholera bacillus in 1883. He studied malaria, uh, bubonic plague, and several other infectious agents, but in 19... 05, he was given the Nobel Prize for Medicine or Physiology because of his discoveries related to tuberculosis. Marie Curie's second Nobel Prize was on this day. So she had won a first one with Pierre Curie, her husband, on the discovery of radium polonium, but then the second one, becoming the first person to win a second Nobel Prize um, because of isolating radium. Okay, but today is about liver, and, and so it became an issue about how do we bring history back into liver, and Craig, I'm sure, will do some of that, but I know that people with chronic alcohol exposure and liver disease develop deficiencies in vitamins. So Carl August Folker, F-O-L-K-E-R-S, died on this day back in um, 1997, and he did a lot of research on vitamins, and because of his research, we uh, were able to isolate vitamin B12, vitamin B12. The other thing is that patients with liver disease in the unit frequently reasoning, res residents order ammonia levels. Whether it's helpful or not all the time, I, I, I'm not certain, but uh, there's, um, this week was the birth of Fritz Haber, and Fritz Herbert Haber was born in 1868, 1868, and he received the Nobel Prize because he developed a method to synthesize ammonia. Hey, that's as close as I could get it. The ammonia was not for medical purposes, and in fact, it revolutionized agriculture because now you could do fertilizers. Hmm? And now he was Jewish, so um, in 1933, he actually had to go into exile. Um, but one of the issues was that he actually introduced poison gases uh, for chemical warfare, warfare in World War I. Okay, so with that, I want to introduce Dr. Craig McLean. Now, everybody in this room knows Craig McLean, but as you know, I like to remind people about who these faculty are because they serve as an inspiration for the students and the residents and faculty in the room and others at the organization. So Craig McLean obtained his MD at the University of Tennessee in 1972. He went on to do internship and residency at the University of Pittsburgh, and in 75-77, he completed his GI fellowship at the University of Minnesota, where he actually remained and, and started his uh, academic career there as assistant professor, but moved in 1986 to UK and became professor there. He was director of the General uh, Clinical Research Center. He was associate chair for uh, research, and in 2000, we were lucky enough to get him here uh, to University of Louisville where he uh, has multiple roles, probably too many to discuss, but let me just mention a few. Director of the Clinical Research Center, Director of Liver Research Program, he's a distinguished university scholar. He is uh, Chief of the GI Division Research Affairs and Co-Director with Dr. Kruger. He's Director of the Clinical Trials Unit and recently became Associate uh, Vice President for Health Affairs and Research. Now, if you look at Craig's CV, 
you'll notice that he has had tremendous contributions in the area of liver disease and the area of nutrition. He has served on multiple editorial boards. He serves on multiple important committees over the years uh, for the VA as well as the National Institutes of Health. He has over 350 publications. He has been very well funded and continuously funded through the VA and the VA system and other forms over time. But I suspect he's most proud of, of the number of trainees and people he have mentored through his career. And there are too many to mention, but all of you know this. He's loyal to his faculty, he's loyal to this organization, and we are proud to have somebody as accomplished as Dr. Craig McLean to discuss today the area of alcohol, liver disease, from bench to bedside and back. Craig? Thanks, Jesse. It's uh, always great to give grand rounds, and uh, we usually uh, try and have an inside speaker do it in December, although December's actually been a great month here, but sometimes it's uh, difficult to get outside speakers here. Jesse mentioned a couple things. So vitamin B12, the level is never low in liver disease. So the liver's the storehouse for vitamin B12, and so Actually, before they had uh, liver scans, why Sheila Sherlock used to do vitamin B12 levels looking for liver abscesses. And ammonia, never, ever order it. Uh, we hate it. <laughs> so uh, what Jesse did mention, uh, I, I was actually going to talk about something else today, but uh, uh, Jesse knows this, that uh, we went in for a alcohol center and I've known for some time that actually we had the best score in the country, but uh, last week we actually signed off on it, so we know we're getting the money. And uh, so I decided to talk about, uh, and Jesse's actually part of this, uh, talk about uh, an alcohol-related problem today, alcoholic liver disease. So uh, unfortunately I have nothing to disclose. I hope to correct that, that I've been uh, on an NIH council and you have to divest yourself of all disclosure, so I'm working hard to uh, get that back. And uh, everything uh, that I talk about today will be off-label, and uh, that's also something that we hope to fix in the future, that we need uh, approved therapies. So in the next 45 minutes or so, I'm going to give a brief overview of addiction and alcoholic liver disease, talk about mechanisms of alcoholic liver disease, and uh, then treatments, which I think you all want to hear about. So this slide is actually uh, from our uh, alcohol center proposal. And so we're looking at alcohol-induced organ injury. And our group is particularly interested in the uh, gut, liver, lung, brain axis. So uh, Winky Fang uh, does uh, gut work with Dr. Barve. Uh, I do alcoholic liver disease with Dr. Kierpik. Uh, Jesse's doing the lung work. Uh, Dr. Chen does fetal alcohol work, and we collaborate with Scott Whittemore in adult brain work. But I'm going to focus on alcoholic liver disease today. Now, it's important to understand the definition of addiction it's defined as a chronically relapsing disorder that is characterized by a compulsion to seek and take drug or stimulus, loss of control and limiting intake, and emergence of a negative emotional state when access to the drug or the stimulus is prevented. And George Koob, who's director of NIAAA, has called that the dark side. So basically, you're taking something in, you can't control it, you're getting less kick each time you take it in, and when you abstain, you feel terrible. So it's a bad thing. So Dr. Roman likes to hear about patients. This, this is kind of a social statement. So uh, I wish my stepmother was here to have heard uh, Jesse's introduction here. So she's uh, 91. She calls herself the uh, queen of stents. And, uh, I uh, just had a aortic valve put in, uh, non-invasively, some experimental thing, and it's doing fantastic. Uh, 
a couple of weeks ago, I went to uh, a funeral of a nurse that had worked for us for a long time. Um, she had breast cancer diagnosed about 10 years ago, went through chemotherapy, did incredibly well for 10 years, and then had recurrence and died. The last person, a, uh, a great guy that I take care of, a 46-year-old veteran, has PTSD, alcoholic cirrhosis. He had hep C, he's been treated, intermittently used heroin, is divorced, um, um, doesn't interact with his family anymore, who actually do, do love him, and he's unemployed. And so we have heart disease, cancer, and drug abuse. So this is a 91-year-old, a 71-year-old, and classically, drug abusers are in their productive years, and those productive years are lost. And so this is a slide from the NIH on the scope and cost of addiction. So here you look at alcohol and prevalence, cancer, not too far apart. <coughs> Jason's sitting there, so he'll tell you cancer is the most important thing in the world. <laughs> and here's uh, HIV, 1.1 million patients. If you look at HIV cost, it's very small in the United States over here compared to alcohol or cancer. 10% uh, of the NIH budget goes to HIV. Uh, that's five to seven times as much as goes to alcohol abuse. So there are social problems in the United States and health problems that um, are well advertised and there are other ones that are kind of under the radar screen. And addiction, unfortunately, is under the radar screen. So two real patients. Uh, so the first one, I, I get up in the morning and work out and listen to uh, sports uh, on TV. And so we'll have Mike 1 and Mike 2 here. So. Mike One is a 58-year-old white male. He's a company president. He owns a huge farm uh, out in Kentucky that he goes hunting on. And he came to me with the new onset of jaundice and ascites and new renal dysfunction. And on physical exam, uh, he was jaundiced. Uh, he had a little ascites and peripheral edema. And laboratory-wise, everything was OK. Uh, what I'd expect for alcoholic hepatitis. His albumin was a little bit low, and he had more renal dysfunction than I would have expected. And the second patient, and I'm showing you that not all people with alcoholic liver disease or drug abuse are poor skid row people, that these are two incredibly uh, well-off people. So the second one, 66-year-old white male, probably some of you knew him, Retired professor, inventor, entrepreneur, tennis player, race car driver. This guy had everything. And uh, he came to me with, again, new onset of uh, jaundice, societies, and his social drinking had expanded into all day drinking. And laboratory, uh, he developed some muscle wasting. Uh, his uh, liver tests were, again, what we expect, AST greater than ALT. Albumin was low. The renal function, fortunately, was maintained. So we'll talk about what happened with these guys at the end. So if you look at alcoholic liver disease, it's a spectrum. It starts out with fatty liver, shown here. And basically, 100% of people or close to it who drink heavily for a week will get alcoholic liver disease. And actually, there's a guy, Charles Lieber, that did that study. So he took normal volunteers, like our medical students, brought them into hospital, fed them alcohol for a week, and did a liver biopsy on them. I don't think we can do that anymore. <laughs> but of people who drink heavily, only a subset will develop alcoholic hepatitis. And even a smaller amount develops cirrhosis, where you can see the re nodules right here. And here's the classic alcoholic hyaline here of alcoholic hepatitis. So here's a hyaline and a, a rim of neutrophils around that that are brought in in the inflammatory response. So 
if not everybody then who drinks heavily develops alcoholic liver disease, there has to be disease modifiers. And the biggest disease modifier is how much you continue to drink. So again, if you stop drinking, why, things usually get better. Sex, uh, females are much more predisposed for the same amount of alcohol. There are some racial differences. Uh, Jesse mentioned diet and nutrition. We'll talk about that later. Uh, genetics, and especially epigenetics, plays a big role, as does smoking. Uh, obesity is a, uh, actually is precipitating and uh, aggravating factor. And then medications, other diseases. As I mentioned, there's no FDA-approved therapy for alcoholic liver disease. So when I give talks at national meetings, uh, and there's always a bazillion drug companies there, I, I purposefully pimp the drug companies because it's embarrassing that we have 59 million new therapies for hepatitis C. We've cured hepatitis C. These companies are arguing on is 94 versus 97 percent cure rate better where we have zero drugs for alcoholic liver disease or non-alcoholic fetal hepatitis. And this is the most inflammatory part of alcoholic liver disease, acute alcoholic hepatitis. So over 50,000 people are hospitalized in the United States, a little less than 1% of all hospitalizations. Length of stay is six and a half days, and this is just about what we are at Jewish Hospital when we look at our service. The cost is $37,000, which is twice the cost of a myocardial infarction, and a very high mortality at one month for patients. These are patients with severe alcoholic hepatitis. So how do we diagnose it? Well, you want an alcohol history first, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. The AST is classically greater than the ALT, unless people have really gone on to more severe cirrhosis. We need to exclude other types of liver disease. And most of the time, we don't do liver biopsies. So we only biopsy people for atypical picture. And uh, this is often controversial. So some medical centers are bigger on biopsies than others. We tend not to biopsy. So we said you want a uh, uh, quantitation of how much alcohol people take. And so there's a great. Uh, website, Rethinking Drinking, that tells you everything you ever want to know about alcohol. And so this is what a standard drink is in different types of drinks, shown pictorially here. So what are the clinical features of alcoholic liver disease? Well, usually guys with alcoholic hepatitis will present with jaundice. They may have tender hepatomegaly, evidence of portal hypertension, or uh, encephalopathy. And usually they're just complaining of a little anorexia, fatigue. They may have fever. And again, if you look at the laboratory tests, the AST and ALT are very helpful. And importantly, the AST is almost always under 400. So the sky-high AST levels is non-alcoholic liver disease. Now, the prognosis for more advanced alcoholic liver disease is really not a good prognosis. So this comes from VA cooperative studies that we participated in several years ago. But the data is about the same today. So people with fatty liver, if they quit drinking and they're not drinking and get in a car accident, why their mortality is basically uh, the same as yours and mine. If you have alcoholic hepatitis, 58% of people are alive at 48 months. If you have alcoholic hepatitis and cirrhosis, only 35% of people are alive at uh, 48 months. So this is a bad prognosis, much worse than many types of uh, breast, colon, or prostate cancer. See, Jason? Now, alcohol not only is a hepatotoxin, but it's also a cofactor for other types of liver disease. So in hepatitis C, it accelerates hepatitis C progression. So uh, here's somebody that used to uh, be on Baywatch uh, who has hepatitis C or had hepatitis C. She actually tweeted out two weeks ago that her hepatitis C is cured. I can't put the picture up that she tweeted out because uh, uh, I get in trouble for that. 
It's also a calorie source for non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, and we'll talk about that. And it enhances certain other hepatotoxins. So what about the calorie source? So here, you're drinking a couple drinks a day, so maybe 250 calories a day. That, that's not much alcohol. But if you figure that it takes 3,500 calories to equal a pound, and you drink every day, why, that ends up being 25 pounds a year. So that's actually a big deal. So dietitians have an issue with alcohol because it's unwanted calories. Now, what about interaction with other drugs? So this is an article that we published in 1980. Um, and so this shows how you can make clinical observations and actually publish something and get involved in research. So we saw three patients who were thought to have alcoholic hepatitis but had SpO2 levels that were incredibly high. And so you just don't see that in alcoholic hepatitis. And they were taking acetaminophen or Tylenol. But at the time, the makers of Tylenol said, you know, the only way you could have Tylenol toxicity was if you took a whole bottle at one time, more than 15 grams. That was on the warning label there. And, uh, and it said it's a totally safe drug. And so we said that actually uh, alcoholics would be predisposed to develop acetaminophen liver injury and worked out the mechanisms for this. So acetaminophen is normally uh, metabolized. It's bound to a sulfate or glucuronide, about 90% and harmlessly excreted. About 10% or so goes over the cytochrome P450-2E1 system. And that, we show, was markedly upregulated with alcohol intake. And what you get is this highly reactive uh, substance called NAP2I that kills cells. But you're still OK if you have enough glutathione, because that binds the NAP2I. And again, you harmlessly excrete it. But in alcoholics, they had low glutathione scores, so two defects that made them much more susceptible to acetaminophen liver injury. And so we were in battles with uh, the company that makes acetaminophen for over a decade trying to get warning labels on. And uh, now they're finally there, and uh, uh, even it's recognized that uh, normal people can even get toxicity with lower doses than what they originally said. So what are the mechanisms for alcoholic liver disease? Well, we start out with this fatty liver, and then there are second hits. And many people have multiple of these. And I'm just going to talk about three that our groups have been particularly interested in, oxidative stress, nutritional abnormalities, and then we'll focus a little bit more on gut permeability and cytokines. So this uh, is a study, again, with uh, healthy volunteers, which means medical students and residents at the University of Pennsylvania, where they brought them in and fed them different amounts of alcohol. Uh, so this is increasing doses. And looked at a marker of oxidative stress or lipid peroxidation and isoprostane level. And this is actually kind of a J-shaped curve. That this is what happens with alcohol mortality, too. So I have a drink or two every night, and people who do that live longer. So uh, if you're abstinent, your life expectancy is up uh, around here, and uh, mortality is up here. And then if you drink, your mortality goes down a little bit. But then if you start drinking too much, it goes back up. So it's the only substance of abuse that actually can be good for you. So as you drink more alcohol, though, your oxidative stress goes up. Malnutrition, this is a picture of one of my patients in a VA cooperative study. You can see the severe temporal muscle wasting uh, that the patient has. And the more severe the alcoholic hepatitis, uh, almost all of these patients uh, get anorexia. And this is one of my uh, uh, favorite figures in nutrition. So it looks at a protein-calorie malnutrition score 
and relates it to mortality and alcoholic hepatitis. So if you're 100, you're not malnourished. And the lower you go, the more malnourished you are. And so it's really a dose-response relationship with mortality. And here we're looking at moderate or severe malnutrition in people who otherwise have similar severity of alcoholic hepatitis. So if you're severely malnourished, you have a worse mortality. And then the last mechanism we'll talk about is the altered uh, gut liver axis. And this is an area of research focus of our group. And alcohol alters the gut barrier function. So it alters mucus, uh, motility, flora, permeability, things leak across like endotoxin, gut-derived toxins. You get endotoxemia. This stimulates cytokine production, and you get organ, organ injury. And that's shown in the cartoon here where we activate the toll-like receptors. Now, the gut barrier is actually incredibly complex. So there's a new article every day on alterations in gut flora doing something. So here's the gut bacteria up here, these little uh, blue babies. But there's a bunch of other things that are involved in gut barrier function. So, and I've shown this cartoon before, the mucus layer, uh, the epithelial cells and purple, the red tight junctions, uh, specialized cells like the PANA cells making antimicrobial peptides, uh, specialized immune cells uh, like the dendritic cells. So uh, basically, if any one of these things becomes abnormal, why well, you can have altered gut barrier function. And alcohol causes disruption of all of these. So I'd like to show human studies. So this is a human study that was done in the 1980s in a British detox unit where they took uh, people who didn't have liver disease, they were just alcoholics, came in and did a radio-labeled uh, marker of gut barrier function. And so the more stuff that comes out in the urine, the leakier your gut is. And you can see the longer they become abstinent, the less leaky their gut is. Now, this is something we can't do anymore, this radioactivity, uh, you know, like giving that to humans now. But we recently did... Uh, a counterpart of this. So <clears throat> in subjects at the NIH, uh, in their human trials unit, we got blood from them. And these people were coming in to be in a detox program. And we measured plasma endotoxin levels on day one, and then as they abstained from alcohol, and the endotoxin levels came down. And if we look at intestinal cells and culture, and look at the barrier resistance, the epithelial resistance, we've shown that increasing amounts of alcohol markedly lower the barrier resistance. And when those gut-derived toxins leak across and go to the Cooper cells, that stimulates pro-inflammatory cytokine production. And so, again, we first showed that back in the 1980s. So Charles D. Norello actually described interleukin-1 and the bioassay for it. And so we worked with him and measured increased IL-1 levels in alcoholic hepatitis patients. So this is the first description of any cytokine in any chronic disease process. And subsequently, we measured the increased TNF in alcoholic hepatitis. So we took peripheral blood monocytes from alcoholic hepatitis patients normal volunteers, and the alcoholic hepatitis patients made much more. And then we showed that uh, plasma TNF was also elevated. So these cytokines actually not only cause the liver injury, but many of the metabolic abnormalities that we see, uh, actually like uh, muscle wasting, like the fever that you see, the neutrophilia, those are all uh, cytokine responses. Now, we're rapidly learning that the cytokines aren't only important in the liver and some of the other systemic organs, but they're important in the brain. And so this is Fulton Cruz, who's head of the North Carolina Alcohol Center. And he's shown that uh, cytokines 
in the periphery can cross the blood-brain barrier and cause brain inflammation. And there are cells in the brain that can release cytokines. And that brain inflammation can cause not only brain injury, but causes addiction, sustains addiction. And so inflammation may be involved in addiction. Now, we're also interested in how diet and alcohol can interact with the gut-liver axis. And so most people think that dietary saturated fat's the bad player and unsaturated fat's good. But there were epidemiologic data suggesting that um, unsaturated fat actually predisposed to alcoholic cirrhosis. And so we looked at that in experimental animals. And as a background, our intake of linoleic acid or corn oil, which is the main uh, dietary unsaturated N6 fat that we take in, has gone up dramatically over the last century. So Dr. Kierpick from our group asked, would feeding a unsaturated fat make animals more susceptible to alcohol-induced liver injury, and would saturated fat protect? And so here we're looking at an intestinal tight junction protein. So with the alcohol and unsaturated fat, it goes down. Saturated fat protects. And correspondingly, endotoxin levels go up in the unsaturated fat, but you're protected with the saturated. And that extends then to our liver injury. So here you see the nice fat droplets and a little inflammation in the unsaturated fat, but not the saturated. Liver triglyceride is elevated. ALT levels are elevated. And so here's then a dietary interaction with alcohol. And this is, again, why we think that some people develop alcoholic liver disease who drink heavily and other ones don't, this dietary interaction. And... Again, we're interested in the gut flora, so we want to know, did diet impact the gut flora in saturated versus unsaturated fat? So in mice and in humans, the two big phyla that we have are the uh, bacteroides and the firmicutes. The firmicutes are in the uh, green here, bacteroides are in kind of the stool brown here. So we can see with the saturated fat that one, six, and eight weeks of alcohol feeding, not much is happening. Unsaturated fat at one week is very similar to what we see here. At six weeks, you're starting to see some other colors come in. At eight weeks, you had huge new phyla coming in here. And so this is the proteobacteria and the actinobacteria. And so here the saturated fat with alcohol causes no change in the bacteria, but the unsaturated does. Now, we think that the bacteria are fine, but the interesting thing to study is what the bacteria are making, so what we call metabolomics. And so we look at stool metabolomics, and specifically at fatty acids. And fecal uh, octanoic acid, a fatty acid that has antibacterial properties, was markedly downregulated in the, the um, unsaturated fat animals. And butyrate, which is a short chain fatty acid, was again downregulated. And this is an important energy source for the uh, intestine, and it also has epigenetic properties. So, what about therapy, which is, I think, what most of you are interested in? So, we'll talk about lifestyle modification, nutrition therapy, drug therapy, and transplantation. So everybody get, should get lifestyle modification. And so we tell people, don't drink, uh, lose weight, don't smoke. So all of our patients clearly follow those types of advices real easily. And uh, so that's one of the problems. The lifestyle modification is difficult. But we know that abstinence at any stage of cirrhosis is good. So here's compensated cirrhotic abstinence or continued abusing alcohol. Here's decompensated 
abstinent, continuing abusing alcohol. And so if you stop drinking any time, you're better off if you have liver disease. And these pictures are just to show you that you can be really sick and decompensated and still come back and be productive. So this is a guy that was one of, one of my VA cooperative studies when I was at Minnesota. And uh, he had huge ascites, an umbilical hernia that's about ready to rupture, uh, which is appropriately called flood syndrome, named after Dr. Flood. And here he is two years later. So I told this guy, if you participate in every one of my clinical studies, I'll take care of you and try and fix you up. And the guy stopped drinking. And so you can see, see markedly improved muscle mass. He's lost his ascites. Uh, he's actually back working. He's reunited with his family. So this is a success story. Increased BMI is a risk factor for development of uh, fibrosis in alcoholic liver disease. Cigarette smoking markedly accelerates fibrosis. What about nutritional therapy? In the 1940s, uh, a guy named Arthur Paytack in Boston um, was taking care of a lot of very kind of what he called skid row alcoholics. And so he got a deal where guys would come in and uh, get a nutritious meal, actually three meals a day, at uh, kind of a uh, soup kitchen and uh, that was 3,000 calories. And what he showed was the people who did that and had a good diet had a better outcome than those who uh, uh, didn't participate in that program. Now, that was clearly not a randomized study. And again, one of my favorite uh, um, graphs, this is again from VA cooperative studies, correlating voluntary food intake and alcoholic hepatitis studies. So if you were taking in more than 3,000 calories a day, even though you had a bilirubin of 17, your mortality was basically zero. If you were taking in less than 1,000 calories a day, your mortality was almost 100%. And stepwise, the uh, gradation in between. Now, the problem with this study was it was a VA study. We had a full-time VA nurse telling these guys to eat. A lot of them still wouldn't eat. So what we need to do is what Dr. Marsano does, is slap a feeding tube down and force them to eat. So that, that's what happened in this study from Spain, a multi-center trial. They randomized people to either getting a feeding tube down and forcing them to eat, and they got a, a 2,000 calories a day of a liver-specific formula or standard of care, which is prednisone. And at one month, which is the uh, uh, primary marker of uh, outcome marker, why mortality was about the same. So feeding was just as good as prednisone. At one year, the people who got feeding actually had a better mortality. Now, Jesse mentioned that there are a variety of nutritional deficiencies that can occur with alcoholism. And I've just listed uh, a few of the micronutrient deficiencies here. And we'll talk about uh, zinc, which uh, we have a particular interest in our group. And uh, actually, Matt Cave has a uh, K23 award on. So. These were studies that I did, again, back in Minnesota, looking at serum zinc levels in normal controls, cirrhotics without decompensation, and cirrhotics with different stages of encephalopathy. And so the worse your liver disease, the lower your zinc. Some of these people had classic skin findings of zinc deficiency, so this is called acrodermatitis. This guy is frequently on boards for the uh, house officers, so uh, remember this. So it's classic skin lesions around the eyes, nose, and mouth for zinc deficiency. And our basic scientists and Dr. Cave have shown that uh, zinc basically impacts every level of alcohol-induced organ injury. And uh, again, 
We have a clinical trial that's closing on that, but the preliminary data are incredibly exciting. Now, one of the very, very important things is late night meals. So if you have a cirrhotic, their liver doesn't store glycogen. So if, if I could have a pill for this, I would be a bazillionaire because these people go into starvation mode overnight. And so this is a great study from Germany where they gave people a couple cans of enthyl supplements either 3 o'clock in the afternoon or 9 o'clock at night and looked at muscle mass. And the ones that got the late night snack from the plaque were able to put muscle mass back on. Uh, they did a little bit of 12 months uh, in the daytime snacks. but uh, So giving a nighttime snack is absolutely critical to maintaining muscle mass. People worry about giving too much protein precipitating encephalopathy. Basically, it doesn't happen. They worry about putting a feeding tube down. Are they going to rupture the varices? Doesn't happen. And I see my patients in clinic, and they're losing muscle mass, and they ask why. And one of the reasons is critical anabolic hormones, in this case IGF-1, are made in the liver. And so they're not making these hormones. So these are the hormones that baseball players like to inject. So our guys aren't getting it. So here's normal up here. And these are people in our alcoholic hepatitis study. So these are guys that are our survivors. So six months after kind of getting better, their IGF-1 levels are still terrible. And so I have all my patients have two-pound weights. I tell them to eat at night, and when they're sitting there watching TV, pump iron. What about drug therapy? So we have a bunch of things that don't work. And the two really disappointing ones were antioxidants, uh, and I still have hope for that, and anti-TNFs. And we know that TNF, a little bit, is important for liver regeneration. And so that's why we think giving anti-TNF didn't work. So what about the steroids and pentoxifilin, the two things that are out there? So you give steroids for people who have severe alcoholic hepatitis. So that's a discriminant function uh, greater than 32. And I used to hate steroids because we classically gave them for a month. And so you could get all kinds of steroid side effects. But now we have this one-week rule. So if your bilirubin doesn't drop over a week, then we know you're not going to respond to steroids, and so you can stop. And so that makes me feel much more comfortable about giving steroids. So, And there are all kinds of calculators. So Dr. Marsano has this on our website, or you can look it up on Google. So Mel, discriminant function, Lily, and I can't remember all these, so you just plug them into a computer. Pentoxifilin is a, a weak phosphodiesterase inhibitor that increases cyclic AMP. And so there was this pivotal study done in 2000 that shows that the pentoxifilin group had a better survival than the controls. And basically what it was doing was blocking hepatorenal syndrome. Now, the article that's just come out in the New England Journal uh, in a multi-center study in Europe, the STOP AH trial looked at prednisone, pentoxifilin, or placebo, or combination, and basically showed that nothing really works statistically better than placebo. And the, there are multiple issues with this study. One is that the uh, placebo group had a very low mortality. And they were using good nutritional support. They were using other reasons to support hepatorenal syndrome. But it puts us in a situation where we have no magic bullet for alcoholic liver disease now. So what about liver transplantation? So classically, we request that our patients be abstinent for six months before we consider liver transplantation. So we don't want people going back to drinking. And 
looking at liver transplant data, recidivism really isn't a cause of uh, further organ injury or loss of an organ. So we do a pretty good job there. Where people actually get into trouble is upper airway and uh, upper GI tumors. And so often they go back to smoking. So they don't drink, but they go back to smoking. And now, in rare situations, alcoholic hepatitis patients are transplanted. Not at our institution, but there are some in the United States. And France uh, does this on a highly selective basis. Now, we not only have an uh, alcoholic uh, a alcohol center that's being funded, but we have a uh, UO1 consortium on alcoholic hepatitis. And this is both a clinical and a uh, translational consortium. And so these are the uh, different groups that are participating. And in the clinical trial, we're looking at alcoholic hepatitis. And we're looking at different stages with different forms of therapy. So uh, I'm giving this ra grand rounds to try and get you guys to send us patients. So in the mild to moderate arm, so that's a MELD under 20. So these are people that you classically wouldn't give prednisone to because the risk of giving steroids versus the benefit isn't great. Mortality is usually under 10%. Uh, and that's at uh, six months. So we're giving them either placebo or probiotic lactobacillus GG. And Dr. Feng from our group has incredible experimental data on value of LGG and experimental alcoholic liver disease. For our severe group, uh, and we've stratified them into sick and really sick. Uh, they either get steroids or a IL-1 receptor antagonist for a short period of time, pentoxifiline for a month, and zinc for the whole six months. And so that study's ongoing, and we'd love to see your patients. What's on the horizon? Uh, there are things called FXR agonists. Uh, the company that makes this, uh, their stock's gone through the roof, so uh, I won't mention uh, what company it is. Uh, there are a host of anti-endotoxins out there. Uh, there's one from Cal Colostrum. And so uh, these are being studied both in alcoholic liver disease and NASH. Uh, we think that, the, well, Pulmonary, for example, they have uh, um, uh, actually a couple now specific PD4 inhibitors for pulmonary fibrosis. So the thing that we're using, pentoxifiline, isn't near as good as this specific drug that the pulmonary people have. So we think that novel PD4 inhibitors may be good. Uh, things that block cell death, like caspase inhibitors. We think that we need to stimulate liver regeneration. So our focus has been on stopping inflammation and cell death. But what we haven't done is stimulate liver regeneration. And our group's using uh, inflammasome inhibitors. So the inflammasome uh, causes IL-1 production. What are some of the things that we need to consider that we probably haven't been doing well? Well, we need. Uh, not to put everybody in the same box. So different treatments for different severities. So that's one of the things that we've really seen in this study. So people that have milder liver disease, uh, giving them some uh, anti-IL-1 or high-dose steroids or stuff like that, the risk is greater than the benefit. But treating them with something to uh, either get them out of the hospital or prevent them from being readmitted, if it's inexpensive and safe, would be good. So we're using probiotics or uh, other things to stabilize gut barrier function. Uh, this intermediate meld uh, is where we think the anti-inflammatory drugs are going to work. And so there's a fair amount of death there, but not everybody dies. Here, everybody dies. And so we need something to block cell death and also stimulate regeneration. And that's what we're looking at in laboratory models now. 
we're totally bad on looking at uh, well, how long we should treat. So all the initial studies, they gave prednisone for a month. So I went back to try and figure out why that was. And basically, that was how long you could keep somebody in a clinical research center back in the 1980s. So no science to it at all. So what we need to do is have our big gun anti-inflammatory drugs for just a week or two, but then have longer term therapy with nutritional things, with uh, pentoxifiling and stuff like that, and have combination therapy, or at least that's our thought now. And the thing that we are absolutely terrible at is getting people into alcohol rehab programs. So I'm a hepatologist. I, I give you steroids, get you better, get you out the door. We need more than that. So in conclusion, um, alcoholic liver disease remains a major health problem. Uh, alcohol can accelerate other liver diseases. Uh, abstinence and aggressive nutritional support are the cornerstone of therapy. And we have new drugs on the horizon. So what happened to our two guys? So our business owner, he's a macho guy. You know, he, he always has a couple of guns with him. So he just stopped alcohol at home. He had no idea that this was causing him any problem. And uh, he was able to do it. But his renal disease progressed. And the renal function was a little bit weird. That bothered me. So it turned out he had IGA, IGA nephropathy, which is a complication of alcohol abuse. And uh, it's very unusual to see it progress after you stop drinking. It happened in him. Uh, because he needed a transplant, I had to do a liver biopsy him to see whether he needed a liver and a kidney or just a liver. So his liver, one year after stopping drinking, still had alcoholic hepatitis in it. And we know that from VA cooperative studies, that the histologic lesion lasts much longer than the biochemical stuff. Uh, he got a transplant from a twin brother, uh, so he's never been on immunosuppressant therapy. Um, Mike number two, uh, tennis player, polo player, alcoholic hepatitis. Um, he got better initially. It came in and saw me. He's putting muscle mass back on. Uh, had a personal trainer. His hair was stiffed up. And uh, then he relapsed. And uh, ultimately he called me up one day, spent a half hour talking to me, trying to make me feel better that he was going to die, he wasn't going to stop drinking, and he didn't want to come see me again. And, and he died a couple weeks later. So alcohol can be a bad thing. We want you to enroll patients in our study. So here's Dr. Vatsalia, our coordinator, and that's his phone number. Thanks. Right. And I wonder if you have a sense of why. The other one that I had is how many of these patients that we get this genome that go through this episode of hospital stay and get alcohol and start what, what percentage of patients have it that go to the next generation? Yeah, so some people get religion when they get really sick. You know, you have to hit bottom and they stop drinking, but Actually, the, the majority of them don't. And they really, again, that's what we do poorly is getting them into some type of treatment program. And we need to look at alcohol abuse drugs in people with liver disease. So that's been poorly studied. Antioxidants. Well, antioxidants. Huge disappointment for me, too. So, I mean, every animal study says it should work. And so whether we need to give more, target them through the mitochondria, uh, give them with something else, you know, I still have hope that they'll work. Um, and we may be giving them in too sick a group of patients. So they're classically studied 
in bad alcoholic hepatitis patients. Maybe we should be studying them in alcoholic cirrhotic disease. Maybe we should be studying them in people who are not, who are alcoholic who have no disease at all. Right. Because they may get the benefit from the government. And, and it may help the inflammation and the addiction. Right, right, right. Yeah, hard to jog if you have ascites, I guess. <laughs> uh, so, um, you know, obviously aerobic exercise is going to be good. Uh, um, get, and getting these guys to do it is uh, tough. But if we can just get them to, like I say, do a little uh, pumping iron, that's good. And your first question. Oh, yeah, that have normal liver enzymes. So, um, probably much less than with NASH. So with NASH, we know on ultrasound, or NAFL, that uh, there are a lot of people that can have normal liver enzymes but have fatty liver. Um, if you have even er early alcoholic hepatitis, I'd expect your AST to be elevated a little bit. So basically, you're cranking out stem cells for regeneration. So, um, and there are a couple of pilot studies giving it where the data looks very good. The company that makes it uh, doesn't want to uh, have us using it because there's going to be a lot of deaths there. And uh, so that's another reason companies don't like dealing with alcoholic hepatitis is. Uh, uh, they always have these SAEs and a lot of deaths. So they use bone marrow yes, bone marrow stem cells. Yes, absolutely. Right, and we actually are looking at a liver stem cell therapy for alkaline hepatitis protocol right now that we may be doing. Yeah, so that's a great question. So we I think that's one of the mechanisms of the unsaturated fat, the N6 fat, uh, linoleic acid. So you get more lipid peroxidation and more oxidative stress with that. So that's a good point. So you want to take zinc, you want to take some of Dr. Feng's lactobacillus GG, uh, maybe a little vitamin E, and um, we, we still think uh, S-adenosyl methionine or SAMe is, is helpful. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, sir. Great. Yeah, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much.